Good afternoon. I'm Scott Suko with the Liver Coalition of San Diego, and I'm glad to be your executive director. We have a great lineup tonight for another liver Q&A webinar, this time focused on children's liver diseases with a fantastic speaker. Before we get started, I wanted to introduce our sponsor for the liver Q&A webinar series, Carl with Dynavax. Hi, Carl. Hi, Scott. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for just giving me a moment or two. I wanted to thank you and thank Dr. Schwartz. It really is a pleasure to sponsor this program. Uh, it's wonderful when the community can be educated like this. Um, I can tell you that here at Dynavax, we have very, very deep ties to this community. In fact, the new two-dose, one-month adult vaccine we have for Hep B has its origins at UCSD from 15 years ago when four scientists discovered the actual adjuvant that's used in the vaccine and created this company. So we have very, very deep roots and it really is such a great feeling to be able to sponsor this program. And uh, I thank you and thank Dr. Schwarz and appreciate the couple of moments just to say hello. Thank you, Scott. Uh, thank you so much, Carl. I'd like to introduce our board president, Terry Cunningham, to share a little bit about the organization and to introduce our speaker, Terry. Hello and good evening. And thank you so much for being here at this uh, webinar. It's another in our series of informational webinars on liver diseases, and um, they are sponsored by the Liver Coalition of San Diego. And the Liver Coalition uh, started a few months ago after the American Liver Foundation decided to close their district offices. We felt that we needed to have a presence of liver experts uh, in San Diego uh, with an organization that people can contact and get all types of information such as this webinar. After uh, this webinar concludes, it will be posted on our website and you'll be able to see it again or refer uh, your colleagues to it. So we are very, very pleased to have Dr. Kathleen Schwartz here uh, to present on children's liver diseases and I'm sure this will be a very informative um, webinar. Thank you so much. Dr. Schwartz. Thank you. So let's see what I need to do to show the full screen. Okay, well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Terry and uh, Scott and Carl. It is a great pleasure to give this web webinar on the alphabet soup of viral hepatitis in kids. And I want to thank the Liver Coalition of San Diego for recognizing the importance of pediatric liver disease. So I speak to you from uh, two sources. Uh, one is uh, Rady Children's Hospital, the UCSD Pediatric Hospital, and the other is Johns Hopkins Charlotte R. Bloomberg Children's Hospital, where I have been uh, a faculty member for 33 years, and I've been working at Rady for about three, and it's been a wonderful experience. So uh, I have no relevant financial relationships and I have uh, been funded uh, to do research by a number of organizations, including uh, the NIH where I'm chairman of the Pediatric Hepatitis B Study Group. Uh, I've been involved in several pharmaceutical trials. I'm involved in uh, pediatric primary sclerosing cholangitis uh, study. And uh, <clears throat> so <clears throat> without further ado, let's get started with our topic. So the objectives of this webinar 
are uh, to discuss and share the various viral etiologies of fulminant hepatitis in children. And fulminant hepatitis, by definition, is uh, acute hepatitis with either encephalopathy and or clotting uh, defect. Uh, I want to share the recommendations for both passive and active he hepatitis A vaccine. Uh, know whom to treat for uh, hepatitis E and what the clinical manifestations are. Uh, understand the recommendations for hepatitis B vaccine for screening and various treatments. Uh, be aware of the recommendations for screening of hepatitis C and the various treatments. And then a virus we really didn't uh, think about uh, as part of the viral hepatitis picture until very recently is COVID-19. So I have to address the question, that, is COVID-19 an unwelcome addition to uh, viral infections of the liver in children? So my uh, slides are not advancing. There we go. Okay, so here is the alphabet soup of viral hepatitis in kids. I'm going to talk about A and hepatitis E, uh, which are in some ways quite similar. They're both RNA viruses. Uh, I've already mentioned the fulminant hepatitis, and we can go over a brief listing of the viral causes and other causes of fulminant hepatitis in kids. Hepatitis B and then uh, its uh, closely related virus, Delta hepatitis, which needs the envelope of hepatitis B to replicate. Hepatitis C and then we'll talk a little bit about COVID. So the viral causes of uh, fulminant hepatitis. Herpes virus uh, is the only immediately treatable cause of fulminant viral hepatitis. So I think it's very important that we all remember that. It's true in kids uh, and it's also true in adults. Hepatitis A, hepatitis B, and hepatitis E also cause fulminant viral hepatitis. And then less commonly, but still uh, real, uh, adenovirus, cytomegalovirus, EBV, parvo, enterovirus in preemies. And those are viruses which uh, can cause fulminant hepatitis, but usually just cause more mild liver disease. And then the acute viral hepatitis, hepatitis A and hepatitis E, uh, as I said, are somewhat similar in their presentations. Chronic viral hepatitis, hepatitis B, the leading cause of liver cancer in the world, uh, and less commonly, it is uh, complicated by hepatitis D, co-infection. Hepatitis C, which used to be the most common cause of liver transplant and liver cancer in the United States. But thanks to fantastic uh, new treatments, uh, I think we're saying goodbye to that viral cat cause of uh, hepatitis. And then we'll talk a little bit about COVID-19. So this is a diagram from the uh, Pediatric Acute Liver Failure Study Group showing that uh, half of the causes of uh, acute liver failure in kids are unknown. The most common recognizable cause is acetaminophen, shown as APAP, and there is an antidote, N-acetylcysteine or mucomist. So it's very important if you identify a child with acute liver failure that one of the very first tests you do is a, a acetaminophen level. And if that is the cause, then uh, the uh, N-acetylcysteine can reverse uh, the failure. And then the other causes are all uh, recognized, uh, including acute autoimmune hepatitis, 
and Wilson's, which is recognizable because it's often associated with hemolytic anemia. Metabolic causes are particular uh, peculiar to kids in that uh, these diseases like galactosemia and tyrosemia, if they do uh, cause acute liver failure in humans, it's in uh, children, not in adults. Whereas in adults, Tylenol, acetaminophen, is the most common cause of acute liver failure. And this is either suicidal or accidental overdose, but in uh, some cases, probably too many cases, this is a so-called therapeutic misadventure. So uh, the patient, uh, let's say, has some other viral infection and takes Tylenol every four hours around the clock for several days and ends up in the intensive care unit with acute liver failure. Uh, and then uh, unknown causes uh, also are on the list. So if you see a child with encephalopathy and or coagulopathy and a fairly abrupt rise in liver enzymes, this by definition is uh, fulminant uh, hepatitis. The tests that we recommend are number one is to look for herpes. And uh, this is true in adults and kids. So uh, the, the first diagnostic test would be a herpes uh, blood PCR and then to start treating with acyclovir until either the herpes diagnosis is uh, validated or some other specific uh, diagnosis. And then you do these other tests for hepatitis A, B, E, and uh, Epstein-Barr virus. And then newborns are peculiar in that uh, they can develop fulminant hepatitis B when they acquire uh, the virus from their infected mothers. And uh, we now know that uh, hepatitis B vaccine, both active and passive vaccine, should be given uh, to an infant of a hepatitis B infected mother uh, to try to prevent uh, uh, hepatitis. And then enterovirus, which usually causes gastroenteritis, can cause fulminant hepatitis in infants. And then there are these other viruses uh, that we should look for if uh, we don't have a diagnosis. So, hepatitis A. Uh, hepatitis A uh, is uh, widely distributed geographically. And of course, we're very close to Mexico in San Diego. So you see that uh, Mexico is red, meaning that there's a high uh, prevalence of uh, hepatitis A. And as you probably know, we've had uh, recent uh, epidemics, particularly among homeless individuals in Southern California. But uh, the virus is widely distributed uh, throughout South America, Africa, Asia, as well as Central America. And there are a number of reports of uh, outbreaks of hepatitis A, usually manifesting as gastroenteritis, uh, Chilean strawberry, that is foodborne, Chilean strawberries, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken had a terrible hepatitis A outbreak, and White Castle. I know it looks like coronavirus, but it's actually hepatitis A. <laughs> so what is hepatitis A? It's a highly contagious viral liver infection. It is preventable by a vaccine and uh, it's fecal oral transmission. Uh, it may last for weeks, but can uh, rarely last for months. The usual symptoms are jaundice, nausea, and abdominal pain. But it's interesting that in infants uh, under a year of age, uh, they're usually asymptomatic. How is it spread? Uh, either direct contact, infected food, or contaminated sewage. This is the uh, serologic picture after inoculation of uh, hepatitis A. So uh, it, it, there is uh, a brief time when the virus is in the blood, 
It is also, as I said, in the stool. And uh, the, uh, a couple of weeks after the patient is exposed to hepatitis A, the liver enzymes be begin to rise. And at that time, the clinical illness with gastrointestinal symptoms uh, is predominant. And then the IgM to anti-hepatitis A falls, the IgG rises, and the illness does resolve. So 90% of the time it is undergoes spontaneous remission, but 10 to 20% uh, there's prolonged jaundice, and then uh, there can be resolution and then relapse in three to 20%. Uh, fortunately, less than 1% of patients will develop the fulminant, uh, often fatal hepatitis. And this just shows you the power of uh, the vaccine. The, uh, at first, there was uh, a voluntary uh, recommendation to pediatricians for uh, hepatitis A vaccine. But in the um, mid-90s, uh, hepatitis A vaccine requirements for uh, children and uh, certain vulnerable adults were initiated uh, by the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Center for Disease Control. And as you see, there was a dramatic decline in the incidence of acute hepatitis A. So there are two vaccines, single antigen inactivated hepatitis A vaccines, uh, Havrix and uh, Vakta. And, uh, they contain both hep hepatitis uh, A and uh, hepatitis B uh, uh, particles. The seroconversion is 100%, uh, and in uh, healthy individuals, the antibody uh, lasts uh, for um, for 20 years. And then in infants as, as young as two months of age, the hepatitis vaccine has been demonstrated to be safe and efficacious, but a travel-related dose to infants six to 11 months of age shouldn't be counted for the routine vaccine because maternal antibody might mask the response. I'm um, having trouble advancing my screen. You can try clicking the blue honeycomb again, and it might. Okay. Well, the blue honeycomb. Okay. Hepatitis E. So uh, hepatitis E, like hepatitis A, has a wide uh, geographic distribution. And as you can see, it also is very common in Mexico, Supra-Sahara Africa, and uh, throughout Asia. And uh, it's not a virus that we know as much about uh, in the United States as B and C, but we're learning. So hepatitis E, like hepatitis A, uh, has a fecal oral transmission. So there are epidemics that have been described uh, in when there were sewage leaks in uh, to a water supply in India, uh, in uh, waters where uh, there's open defecation, uh, there is some, some person to person transmission, and very importantly for pediatricians and internists and OBGYN doctors, uh, there is a high fatality rate in pregnant females for reasons that are not understood, and there is a vertical transmission of hepatitis E. And uh, also, there is uh, some transmission 
from uh, animals to humans. In fact, in Italy, we've described uh, an epidemic uh, of uh, hepatitis E in the part of Italy where wild boar, where Chingali is ingested. So uh, it's a, a serious infection. So commonly, uh, there is acute uh, asymptomatic hepatitis just with liver enzyme elevation. There can be uh, hepatitis with jaundice. In immunosuppressed individuals, there can be chronic infection uh, and it can work with some hepatotoxic drugs uh, to cause a drug-induced injury. There are even rare cases of uh, neurologic conditions with hepatitis E and uh, miscellaneous clinical uh, symptoms. And then if you have underlying uh, liver disease, uh, such as hepatitis C, uh, hepatitis E can have a worse course. The incubation period is three to eight weeks. It has a short prodrome. Uh, jaundice lasts days to several weeks, and most cases are self-limited, but uh, it does have a case fatality rate of up to 10% in otherwise normal individuals, but as I said, 20% fatality rate in pregnant females. And this is uh, the typical serologic, serologic course. There's exposure at week zero, and then the virus is shed in the stool, and uh, then the viral shedding happens before the symptoms happen, which is one of the reasons why uh, hepatitis E can cause epidemics. The IgM rises about the time the patient is symptomatic, and then declines, and the IgG rises. This just gives you an alert algorithm of how to manage exposure to hepatitis E. Uh, there is an RNA test that's commercially available and that should be monitored for three to six months. But if it is detected uh, for uh, months, then that's considered chronic. And this is particularly a problem in immunosuppressed patients. Uh, one, once one recognizes the uh, hepatitis E, uh, immunosuppression should be reduced and the viral load monitored, uh, and there can be clearance, but if there isn't clearance, then this is an indication for ribavirin monotherapy. And then if that doesn't work, uh, ribavirin monotherapy or pegylated interferon therapy. So it is uh, a cause of viral hepatitis that we are recognizing increasingly in both adults and children. So on to hepatitis B and hepatitis D. So hepatitis B is uh, widely distributed and this is very important because it is uh, vaccine preventable and it is treatable. There are roughly 370 million individuals in the world, and we really don't know how many children in the world there are, but since uh, probably the major route of transmission of hepatitis B is from mother to infant, uh, the number of uh, infected children is quite likely to be quite large. So the dark blue shows the area of high uh, prevalence and so on. It's important for us physicians in America to uh, recognize the areas of high prevalence because when we see patients who have either come from those countries or uh, their parents have come from those countries, then we need to screen. So how does one acquire hepatitis B? Well, certainly uh, blood and blood products, but uh, as you probably know, the blood supply is now screened uh, for hepatitis B, so it's unlikely to be contaminated. 
but still possible. Uh, it is sexually transmitted. Uh, it can be acquired uh, from organs, from, from livers which are uh, infected or kidneys. As I said, uh, transmission from mother to baby is probably the most common route. Contaminated needles and syringes, and and then there is uh, transmission uh, via close contact, which is horizontal, and that seems to happen more in Africa than any other place in the world. Maybe because of scarification uh, procedures. So it's 50 to 100 times more infectious than HIV. So it's really uh, a virus that we need to protect our patients against. So 90% of infected children progress to chronic disease, whereas less than 5% of infected immunocompetent adults progress to chronic disease, which is probably why uh, the infected infant is probably the number one culprit in uh, spreading the virus uh, around the world. Greater than 30% of individuals with chronic hepatitis B will progress to uh, serious liver disease, cirrhosis, liver cancer, uh, and, and or liver failure. And hepatitis B is certainly an acceptable indication for liver transplantation, but uh, it would be much better to be, prevent the infection than to try to be treating it. So this is, uh, I think, a very uh, compelling slide. It shows that infants who acquire hepatitis B at birth are uh, very rarely symptomatic symptomatic infection doesn't really uh, happen until uh, children uh, acquire the virus uh, after 12 months of age, with those rare exceptions of the newborns who acquire hepatitis B from their mothers and have fulminant hepatitis. Whereas uh, the rate of chronic infection is highest in infants who acquire hepatitis B at birth, and then the age of acquisition uh, dictates uh, declining rates of chronic infection. And this to me is a, a very dramatic slide. This was uh, an analysis of gaps in access to care and treatment in the United States. So it's been estimated that as many as 2 million subjects are infected with hepatitis B, uh, only uh, about 400 to 600,000 are aware of their infection, and the number potentially eligible for treatment is uh, around 500,000. But of those 500,000, only 10% actually get treated. So we really need to work very hard in this country to raise uh, awareness of the need to screen children and adults for hepatitis B. And who should be screened? Uh, persons born in areas of high hepatitis B uh, sero prevalence, and that's most of the world, most of the world with the exception of the United States and Western Europe and Australia and Southern South America, but everything else pink. <laughs> So how do you screen your patients for hepatitis B? Well, hepatitis B surface antigen uh, suggests either acute or chronic infection. Same thing for E antigen. And then the antibodies, anti-core antibody is a marker of present or past infection. Anti-E uh, shows low infectivity or mutant hepatitis B virus. Anti-surface antibody is a marker of immunity, and it is the way that we measure response to vaccine. And then the way one measures uh, active infection is hepatitis B DNA. So this shows uh, the uh, graph of the serology in a patient that has acute infection and then recovery. 
So symptoms, usually GI symptoms and jaundice, and then the patient remains E antigen uh, positive for uh, up to 12 weeks, and then at some point converts to uh, anti E. And then the anti core antibody rises, the anti the IgM anti core antibody falls and then the surface antibody rises. So if we do see acute infection, what we hope to see is recovery. Whereas uh, this virus has a propensity to cause chronic infection. So those unlucky individuals who are chronically infected will be E uh, antigen positive, sometimes for many weeks after exposure, and then will eventually become anti-E antibody positive, but remain surface antigen positive. The total anti-core will be positive, and then the IgM declines. Well, what about pediatric issues? This is supposed to be a talk about kids. So I've already uh, discussed the problem with uh, fulminant hepatitis in with hepatitis E uh, during pregnancy. Uh, that is less common in uh, pregnancy uh, with hepatitis B, but the main problem with uh, pregnancy and hepatitis B infected women is they have a high tendency to give hepatitis B to their newborns. So newborns born to infected women need to have active and passive vaccine within 12 hours of birth to be uh, completely protected. And if the mother has a high viral load, uh, greater than um, 20,000 international units per ml of hepatitis B DNA, then uh, those pregnant women should be given an antiviral agent in the third trimester. And that practice combined with the vaccines has radically uh, reduce the number of babies who have infection when they're born to their infected mothers. Breastfeeding is okay unless the pregnant mother has uh, uh, mastitis or uh, cracked bleeding nipples. Uh, school, that's a, big, that's a big one because uh, the infected child uh, who is infected with hepatitis B uh, does not need to disclose to school officials the infection status. Hepatitis B is transmitted by blood and sex. It's not transmitted in respiratory secretions. And of course, hepatitis B infection is a matter of stigma. So uh, the, the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, handbook says, that the hepatitis B infected child should be allowed in school unless uh, he or she is a biter and has open bleeding skin lesions. Uh, immunosuppression is a problem even for hepatitis B carriers because immunosuppression uh, may uh, unmask uh, ha active hepatitis B. So all uh, subjects undergoing any kind of immunosuppression should be screened for hepatitis B. And then the don't ask, don't tell uh, issue of privacy uh, has made it all the way to the Supreme Court. And uh, there is legal uh, guarantee and legal protection for families who have uh, children with hepatitis B. You don't have to tell unless it's up to you. And then of course, uh, monitoring. So uh, how should uh, hepatitis B surface antigen positive patients uh, uh, be counseled? Well, sexual contacts should be vaccinated. Uh, there should be barrier protection during sexual intercourse if the partner is not vaccinated or naturally immune. Uh, toothbrushes and razors are not supposed to be shared. Uh, open cuts and scratches should be covered. Uh, Blood spill should be cleaned up with detergent or bleach, and uh, hepatitis B 
positive individuals should not donate blood or organs or sperm. And as I said, it's very important that infants born to hepatitis B infected mothers uh, be vaccinated within 12 hours of birth. And then kids who are infected with hepatitis B can participate in all activities, including contact sports, and they can share food and utensils, and they can kiss each other, but uh, they should not be excluded from daycare or school participation, and they should not be isolated from other children. A friend of mine uh, in Taiwan, uh, Dr. May Wee Chang, did this elegant study, which was published in the New England Journal, that showed that uh, after a routine infant immunization in Taiwan against hepatitis B, the incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma among children fell dramatically. So there are treatments for children with hepatitis B. Alpha interferon, lamivudine, adefavir, but probably the two most popular uh, treatments that are the most effective with the less least drug resistance are entecavir and uh, tenofovir. There now is uh, a newer form of tenofovir called TAF that uh, is approved for adults it uh, tenofovir, TDF, does have some kidney and uh, bone toxicity. The TAF does not. And actually at Rady and Johns Hopkins, we are currently uh, undergoing a uh, pediatric trial with the TAF. So the last on the list, hepatitis C. So there are about 170 million individuals in the world with hepatitis C. And the red area, Supra-Sahara Africa, has the distinction of having the most cases. Uh, and uh, they're probably among those 170 million infected individuals, there are, are estimated to be about 11 million children. So this shows you the map of the United States. And uh, in uh, Southern California, we have kind of an intermediate prevalence to hepatitis C. Of course, this, this was 2010 uh, data, so it may have ch changed a bit uh, recently. And this is a graph showing uh, the acquisition of hepatitis C. In adults, it is most frequently injection drug use. 60% and sexual transmission. And then uh, before the blood was screened, transfusion. And in children, uh, it is much more likely maternal fetal transmission. About 5% of infected mothers pass their, the virus on to the children. Uh, it, the passage is about twice that in co-infected uh, mothers co-infected with HIV. So these are the symptoms of hepatitis C, but uh, the virus is actually fairly indolent. So uh, it causes uh, most trouble in the liver because of progressive uh, fibrosis and ultimately cirrhosis. And uh, hepatitis C and hepatitis B are the leading causes of liver cancer, at least in America in adults. The course of illness with hepatitis C, acute infection, uh, and this is a uh, graph showing the clearance in adults, but uh, children who acquire hepatitis C from their mother have about 50% about have spontaneous clearance. And then, as I said, it has a, a great tendency to cause chronic inflammation to progress to fibrosis and cirrhosis and cancer. How do you diagnose hepatitis C? Well, uh, there is an antibody screen and infants who are born to uh, mothers with hepatitis C should be screened with the antibody at 18 months because if it's done before, it may reflect 
uh, passive transmission of the antibody. So uh, if the antibody is positive, then one does a hepatitis C RNA, and uh, if it is detected, then the individual is considered to have a current hepatitis C infection. So the great news on this virus is that uh, in 2017, the FDA approved two hepatitis C drugs for pediatric patients that are in the direct acting antiviral class. And these are highly effective and safe. So they have revolutionized the treatment of hepatitis C first in adults and now in kids. So this was a trial we did uh, with Lodipasvir and Sofosbuvir uh, in uh, 33 children and all but one cleared the virus and the one who did not uh, discontinued the treatment because of uh, the drug tasted yucky according to the child. But uh, this drug has a very high uh, efficacy and safety profile. And so uh, in March 19th, 2020, I just realized this was about the time when COVID hit us. The only thing good that happened that week was that the FDA approved uh, the combination of sofosbuvir and valpatosvir for children ages six and older and weighing at least 17 kilos who had chronic hepatitis C. And the reason this was such great news is that <clears throat> this drug combination is pangenotypic and panfibrotic, so it could be given to patients with cirrhosis as well as mild disease, and it's given once daily. So this was just a major breakthrough. And my last slide has to do with the virus that you keep seeing on the nightly news, COVID-19. So, Yes, it does get into the liver. It gets in, I think, to most organs. And so how does it injure the liver? Well, uh, it uh, can injure the liver in a variety of ways. With the respiratory failure, which seems to be so characteristic with severe infection, uh, there can be hypoxia and also uh, venous congestion. So there's also an immune response to the virus that injures the liver. And then drugs given for SARS-CoV-2 may uh, be responsible for, for some drug-induced liver injury. Patients who have previous liver disorders, particularly adults, may be at increased risk. And then, of course, there are the cytokines that are hepatotoxic. So COVID-19 uh, is uh, capable in, of infecting uh, the gut and viral RNA is detected in stool even after the nasopharyngeal swabs are negative. And uh, elevated transaminases are common in severe disease, but uh, serious liver dysfunction is uncommon. Routine endoscopy should be avoided uh, during the pandemic because this is aerosol generating procedure. And then children, and this is good news for us gastroenterologists, children with inflammatory bowel disease, with chronic liver disease, and even those who had had a liver transplant in general, with some exceptions, but in general, don't seem to have an increased risk of disease and should continue their medications. So I think that that is all I have to say about viral hepatitis in kids. I'm happy to take questions. Great, thank you, Dr. Schwartz. Uh, a couple comments from those who had uh, submitted questions using the chat box was what a comprehensive presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much. You really covered a lot of territory and answered a lot of questions. Um, with the, the new recommendations out regarding mask wearing <clears throat> and stating that it protects you as well as protects others. Um, and then the practice that children really don't 
um, don't need to wear masks. Does that change any of your recommendations? Uh, no. Based on no, okay, perfect. No, I think uh, we we liver doctors all agree that uh, social distancing and masks uh, should be done by all kids, perfect. unless uh, unless there is a sports reason. I do uh, I do let my uh, kids who have some kind of mild liver disease, uh, I do let them play sports. It's, as, as you know, this whole mask issue is a risk benefit and kids who are stuck at home <laughs> are going nuts as are their parents. So uh, with great caution, uh, we I just let uh, a hepatitis B infected child the other day uh, who's an avid soccer player. I told him to go ahead and go play soccer. Great. Well, thank you very much for um, making yourself available for the webinar. Um, it looks as though, uh, just a couple comments, just bravo. Thank you very much for making yourself available. Continue in the chat box. So what we'll do is we will, um, this has been recorded. This will be uploaded on our YouTube channel and our website and available for future viewing. And as a resource, it really is packed with information. And thank you, Dr. Schwartz, for being part of the Liver Coalition of San Diego's Liver Q&A webinar series. And with that, have a great rest of the evening. Thank you for caring about the kids. Yes. <laughs> Thanks so much. Good night. Good night.